In a world where princesses and battles fill a child's imagination, kids learn they can't win every game, ace every test, conquer every challenge. But there is good news. We don't need to. We have a champion. At Mighty Fortress, kids celebrate Jesus, our savior, our king, our fortress and sure defense. So raise your banner. Hold it high. Shout it loud. The battle is done. In Jesus, the victory is won. Father's Day. If you're a father and you haven't gotten one of these cool cups, I invite you to grab one on your way out. I, yeah, there was, a, there was a printing mistake, I believe. The red and white ones I ordered showed up with the wrong colors. I don't know how that happened. But to start out this morning, let's everybody stand up and greet each other. If you see a father, wish him a happy birthday. Or not happy birthday, that happy Father's Day. Happy birthday.
song we sang last week. It's a new song, so we'll just hope you sing along with us. Who? 
come to prayer time this morning. I want us to keep eternity in mind. Um, I have to admit I've been discouraged by recent events of life. Uh, I've struggled with why questions and, uh, you know, what, how is, how is God working in all of this? Um, but I, as I look at our list, uh, I'm da- I doubt I'm the only one that struggled with that. Um, we pray because people are suffering. We pray because we want, we want life instead of death. Uh, but as we keep our eyes looking ahead... Um, all the questions that we struggle with, God will sufficiently answer in eternity. From Isaiah 25, and this is reiterated uh, in a few places in the New Testament, in Isaiah 25 it says this, O Lord, you are my God, I will exalt you, I will praise your name. For you have done wonderful things, plans formed of old, faithful and sure. For you have made the city a heap, the fortified city a ruin. The foreigner's palace is a city no more. It will never be rebuilt. Therefore, strong peoples will glorify you. Cities of ruthless nations will fear you. For you have been a stronghold to the poor, a stronghold to the needy in his distress, a shelter from the storm and a shade from the heat. For the breath of the ruthless is like a storm against a wall, like heat in a dry place. You subdue the noise of the foreigners as heat by the shade of a cloud, so the song of the ruthless is put down. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. And the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Let's pray. God, we so easily forget that that you sit enthroned over eternity. That you are sovereign over over your creation. And we don't see how how you're working all the time. God, help us to keep you in your proper place. Help us to keep our eyes fixed on you. We pray for those who are suffering, that you would give them strength to endure, that you would bring healing. Pray for our nation. We pray that evil would be punished, that good would be rewarded. And we pray for those that are stuck in sin, uh, that you would break the chains and release them. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. For my meditation this morning, uh, I wanted to focus on fathers a little bit. So happy Father's Day to all the dads who are with us today. I have been truly blessed in my life to have two great parents. Today is about fathers, so I will focus on them. I love my dad, and I also like him. I'm not sure that that is the case in all families. I am fortunate to get to spend time with him nearly every day. Growing up, he was my role model. I wanted to be like him. Still do, I guess. I hope that you have great memories of time spent with your fathers too. One of the things I'm so thankful about my dad is he's a godly man. He was and still is a good example of living a Christian life, being a man of faith. 
He is not perfect, none of us are, but he's doing his best. I thank him for all he has done for me. I would like to look at a man of faith in the Bible, not one you would normally think of. I would like you to think about Joseph and the faith he had. He was pledged to be married to Mary, who got pregnant. He was going to divorce her, but was told by an angel she had done no wrong and that he should marry her anyway. So he did. Later, the Lord warned Joseph that Herod was going to try to kill them and that he should take his family to Egypt. So he did. In the middle of the night, he packed up his family and went to Egypt. After Herod died, the Lord told Joseph to come back to Israel. So he did. Herod's son was ruling, and for their safety, God told them to go to Galilee. They ended up in the town of Nazareth. The last mention of Joseph I know of is in Luke, where a 12-year-old Jesus worries his earthly parents by spending time at his heavenly father's house. In all of this, Joseph, Joseph was a man of faith. He listened when God told him to do things. How easy would it have been to walk away when Mary told him she was pregnant or when his life was put in danger? But he didn't. And because of his faith of this father and mother too, the plan that our heavenly father had designed was put into motion. Our father in heaven knew that this faithful couple was needed to raise his son here on earth. They knew that Jesus was special, but they didn't understand what was in store for him. When Jesus died for our sins on the cross, Mary is there, but Joseph is not. This faithful father didn't live long enough to see what his son would do to save the world. Don't let this sacrifice be in vain. Take this opportunity to accept the grace that God has provided us through his son. Our faithful fathers would want that.
forgiveness of our sins. This is a debt we can never repay. Let us remember all that was given at this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Thank you kids for those kind words. I can affirm that Brady is indeed crazy on the counter. Uh, let's see, uh, on Mother's Day we had some competitions and crowned some mother's champions and we are going to do the same thing today for some fathers. Okay, the first is just going to be, uh, we, need, uh, we need to know which of our fathers win in certain categories. The first one I want to know is which father has a child the furthest away today? So we'll start with out of the country. Anybody have a child this morning is out of the country? Boy, Ted Kriegel's gonna wish he was here. All right, Bob, you got one. Where's yours? Croatia. Croatia. Can anybody beat Croatia? No. All right, Bob is the champion father in this category. There's a Tyson's gift card. That's like father's. Uh, Father's dream out there. Way to go. Oh, yeah, give him a round of applause. Absolutely. Okay, next I want to know which father has the most kids in church today? Do we have any father with three here? No, nope, I only got two. Taylor has three. Anybody with three? No, Taylor, you're the winner. Congratulations, champion dad. All right, for our last gift card, we have more of a, an active competition. And uh, last time when we did this on Mother's Day, I let some mothers pick the fathers who were to, or let some fathers pick the mothers who were to participate in the competition. I got a little trouble for that. So it's only fair that we do the same today. So if you have a father that you would like to volunteer to participate, oh, I think Joe Kriegel has a, uh, volunteered. So I need three, so I'm going to need two more. So if you know, oh, Trap or, or Thomas, all right, let's, Thomas, let's go, let's get up here. You're in, you're, you're competing today. Joe, you got to come up here, buddy. You were volunteered. No, 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 but you are a father, and you are going to participate in our competition today. I need one more. So anybody want to give up their husband or father for this competition? Oh, Dave, absolutely, Dave, come on up here. Okay, all right. You guys are going to need some tools, so I've got a uh, hammer for you. You got a hammer, okay. And uh, here you go, Joe. <laughs> Just take that one. Okay. Need a bench here. Okay. This is not necessarily a father's job, but a lot of times it's dad that ends up doing it. Sometimes we need a lot of stuff fixed. So you have got three eight penny nails here that you're going to have to sink into this wood. So the first one to send them all the way down is going to be our champion father and receive a Tyson's gift card. So I'll, tra I'll trade you out here, Joe. No, it's not fair, man. You can send all three with this one. That's no fair. It's no fair. Okay. So, right, don't, don't stand too close to Joe, okay? So you just got to send these nails. The first one to sink them all is our champion dad. On your marks, get set, hammer. We got a winner, Thomas Williams, you are the champion, excellent, so I've got to finish up here, all right, oh, look, you didn't drive one, no, I think Dave planted one on their board there for you, 
So thanks for participating. You're excellent. Joe, I should have let you use the big hammer, I guess. Way to go, guys. Uh, before uh, we go on with our Five Kings series, I need to announce we've got something really big going on at church this week, and that is Vacation Bible School. And so we saw a video about that at the beginning of church today. Uh, VBS is going on all week in the mornings from Monday through Friday, and uh, we have a lot of volunteers ready to help, and we want you to send kids, your kids, the kids you know, send them to VBS. We're going to have a blast. Uh, one thing I heard from uh, Renee today, Renee, our fearless VBS leader, uh, is that if you plan on helping us with VBS and she doesn't know about it yet, you're running out of time, okay? So uh, if you plan on helping us out with VBS, we're really thankful about that, but you got to let Renee know so we know who to plan for, and so uh, be sure to talk to her if you haven't already, and you're going to come help us out with VBS. Uh, again, that starts tomorrow morning. And uh, so on Father's Day, uh, we're not going to, well, this is my Father's Day tie, by the way. I don't know if you knew this, but this was my gift this morning. So um, I want to talk about an important job that fathers have in our families this morning. Uh, we're not going to leave our five king series. We're going to keep going to our next king. And through him, through the king we're going to look at today, we're going to see the scripture teaches us a lesson about leadership, about being an example and influencing our children for generations. As we do this, I'll bring you along in the history of the nation of Israel so that we can see and understand the context of each king that we examine. So all throughout the series, as we go king to king, we'll catch up on what's been going on with Israel in the Old Testament uh, so that we can understand the stories that the Bible tells us about them. Last time we talked about Saul, the first king of Israel. We didn't so much look at Saul himself, but we looked at the sinful decision that the Israelites made to be like everybody else, to forsake God's leadership and choose leadership the way the world does it, choose somebody else to lead them besides God. This was Saul's kingdom, the orange part. Saul was succeeded by David. We talked a little bit about David. David is the hero of the Old Testament. David wrote many of the Psalms. He's described as a man after God's own heart. David is a hero. What was important about David is that David was faithful to God. Now, that was not always the case. David sinned famously with Bathsheba. But despite that sin, David was faithful in that he only worshipped the one true God. That's all that David did. He never wandered astray from worshiping the one true God. But David, even though he was faithful to God, David still had a very hard time with his children, okay? Uh, you had Amnon, he was, a, he was a rapist, his oldest son of the incestual variety. Uh, Absalom, he was a rebel. He had to be put down with many spears. Uh, Adonijah, like his brother Absalom, an, a usurper. All these children of David's were bad. He was succeeded by one of his younger sons, Solomon. Solomon was the second son that was born to Bathsheba. So this was David's kingdom. You'll see it's the, uh, the orange part or the uh, reddish part here. As you can see, it's expanded. David has pushed back the Philistines into their corner of the world. Even the, uh, the Phoenicians have been and the Phoenician Sidonians have been pushed back. And the territory of Israel has been expanded. Okay? David was faithful to God, and God rewarded David's faithfulness by giving Israel success. So when David is succeeded, succeeded by his son Solomon, Solomon is in a position to do well. Israel is well positioned to gain influence and power. Solomon has everything set up for him to succeed. God appears to Solomon twice. The first time, to grant Solomon a wish, Solomon selects wisdom. God says that was a good thing for him to pick. The second time God appears to Solomon, God offers Solomon a covenant-style promise, a deal. In 1 Kings chapter 9, verse 45, I'm sorry, verses 4 through 5, is the beginning of this deal that God offers Solomon, okay? He says, as for you, 
If you walk before me faithfully with integrity of heart and uprightness, as David your father did, and do all I command and observe, my decrees and my laws, I will establish your royal throne over Israel forever, as I promised David your forefather when I said, you shall never fail to have a successor on the throne of Israel. So that's the promise part. If you remain faithful to me, I will keep your family on the throne. You will be in Israel forever, and I will bless you. But the deal also is not only a promise, it is also a threat. The next verses, 1 Kings 9, 6, and 7, God issues the warning. But if you or your descendants turn away from me and do not observe the commands and decrees I have given you and go off to serve other gods and worship them, then I will cut off Israel from the land I have given them and I will reject this temple I have consecrated for my name Israel will then become a byword and an object of ridicule among the peoples. Solomon was an incredibly successful king. Uh, go back a couple slides here to where you can see Solomon's kingdom. Okay, That's the whole uh, tan shaded area there. The green is modern day Israel. But Solomon's kingdom stretched all the way down from Egypt to the Euphrates River. Just a huge swath of land. The biggest Israel ever was, was during Solomon's rule. He built the temple of God, Solomon did. It was one of the true wonders of the ancient world, gigantic, decadent. Solomon's palace was even larger and more ornate than the temple. The depictions in scripture of how rich and decadent Solomon's kingdom were are extreme. 1 Kings 10 Verse 21 tells us that there was so much gold in Solomon's kingdom that silver became worthless, unsuitable for official use or currency. But there was something else going on during Solomon's rule. The story of Solomon as king is not completely a story of success. Because while Solomon had, was accumulating territory, while Solomon was making good political deals, while Solomon was amassing wealth, and riches for Israel, there's a parallel story about Solomon that is even more important. The parallel story is about Solomon's faithfulness to God. In 1 Kings 11, the Bible tells us about what was happening to Solomon's faithfulness and the religious practices of his people in Israel. This is what it says. It says, King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughter, Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites. They're from nations about which the Lord told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them because they will surely turn your hearts after their gods. Nevertheless, Solomon held fast to them in love. He had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines. And his wives led him astray. As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God as the heart of David his father had been. He followed Asherah, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites. So Solomon did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He did not follow the Lord completely as David his father had done. On a hill east of Jerusalem, Solomon built a high place to Chemosh, the detestable god of Moab. And from Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites, an altar on which children would have been sacrificed. He did the same for all his foreign wives who burned incense and offered sacrifices to their gods. The Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. Although he had forbidden Solomon to follow other gods, Solomon did not keep the Lord's command. So the Lord said to Solomon, since this is your attitude and you have not kept my covenant and my decrees which I commanded you, I will most certainly tear the kingdom away from you and give it to one of your subordinates. Nevertheless, for the sake of David your father, I will not do it during your lifetime. I will tear it out of the hand of your son. Yet I will not tear the whole kingdom away from him, but will give him one tribe for the sake of David my servant, for the sake of Jerusalem which I have chosen." God promises Solomon that because of his unfaithfulness, because of the way that he led the Israelites to worship 
other gods, to set up idols, high places, altars for other gods, that he would tear much of Israel out of his hands, out of the hands of his dynasty, his son. And he would give it to one of his subordinates. That subordinate is king number two in our five kings study. His name is Jeroboam. Put the switch on myself there. Jeroboam, there we go. <laughs> Jeroboam was in charge of all the laborers in Israel. That was a big job, right? Solomon had laborers all in all of Israel working for 20 years constantly on the temple and on his palace. Jeroboam was in charge of all of them. He was a very important man. Shortly after Scripture records this condemnation of Solomon, where God tells Solomon, because of your unfaithfulness, I'm going to tear much of Israel out of your hands, we are introduced to Jeroboam. Jeroboam is approached by the prophet Ahijah there later in chapter 11. We're told that the prophet of God, Ahijah, was wearing a new cloak. But when Ahijah approaches Jeroboam, Ahijah takes off his new cloak and he cuts it into 12 pieces. We're going to start reading what the prophet Ahijah tells Jeroboam in chapter 11, starting in verse 31. This verse is printed on the back of your bulletin. Ahijah tells him, Take ten pieces for yourself. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. See, I'm going to tear the kingdom out of Solomon's hand and give you ten tribes. But for the sake of my servant David and the city of Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, he will have one tribe. I will do this because they have forsaken me and worshipped Asherah, the goddess of the Sidonians, Chemosh, the god of the Moabites, and Molech, the god of the Ammonites, and have not walked in obedience to me, nor done what is right in my eyes, nor kept my decrees and laws as David, Solomon's father, did. So Jeroboam is told by God that he is going to be the king of most of Israel. A fascinating thing to me is that God makes the same promise to Jeroboam as he did to David, as he did to Saul, as he did to Solomon. David tells Jeroboam that if you walk in my ways, if you remain faithful to God, then I will make you into a great nation and I will preserve your dynasty. It will be a kingship like that of David. God goes on to make the same warning as well. If you are unfaithful to me, if you, don't, uh, if you worship idols, if you are unfaithful to the one true God, I will, God would tear down Jeroboam's kingship. Now Solomon was still alive when God made this promise to Jeroboam. Jeroboam, uh, Solomon is aware of what happened, so Jeroboam has to flee down to Egypt to escape Solomon's wrath. But Solomon dies. When Solomon dies, Solomon is succeeded by his son, Rehoboam. Rehoboam, his son, was foolish. You can read that story, you should. Uh, Rehoboam refuses to listen to the advice of his advisors, quite unlike his father. And as that foolishness results in the ten northern tribes of Israel rebelling against him and making Jeroboam, son of Nebat, their king. Whether or not Jeroboam was a success as a king of Israel depends on the perspective on which you look at Jerob or from which you look at Jeroboam. If you are a disinterested secular historian studying the nation of Israel, then Jeroboam was a very successful king. Jeroboam reigned for a long time. He did very well for the nation of Israel. It is not hard to make a rebellion last. Or it's not easy, I'm so, sorry. It's not easy to make rebellion last. It is very difficult. But Jeroboam secedes from, from Judah and creates their own nation, these ten northern tribes. By the time that Jeroboam dies, Judah, the southern tribes, had been through three kings already. So the northern country of Israel, up here, was where Jeroboam reigned. The portion that God left for David and Solomon's dynasty is down here in Judah, the tribes of Judah and Benjamin. In the Bible, though, from the Bible's perspective, Jeroboam was a very bad king. In the Bible, Jeroboam is remembered for only one thing, that is idolatry. Jeroboam, listen, or 
I guess listen to what the Bible tells us that Jeroboam did in 1 Kings chapter 12. Jeroboam thought to himself, the kingdom will now likely revert to the house of David. This is Jeroboam's talking. If these people go up to offer sacrifices at the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem, they will again give their allegiance to the Lord. Rehoboam, king of Judah, they will kill me and return to King Rehoboam. So Jeroboam's worried. He just seceded, and he knows that the practice of the Jewish religion, the practice that God told them to do is to go to Jerusalem to worship the Holy Days, to celebrate festivals like the Passover. Okay? And Jeroboam knows that if his people are always going down to Jerusalem, then, then the nation of Israel, the one they just created, would fall back into the hands of Rehoboam's dynasty. That his kingdom would be taken away. That's what Jeroboam believes. Even though God had promised him that if Jeroboam was faithful to God, he would preserve his dynasty, he would preserve his family, his kingship. Even though God had made that promise, Jeroboam is convinced that if his people keep going down to Jerusalem to worship God, that they will leave Israel, that they will, beca- they will be allegiant to Judah. After seeking advice, picking up in verse 28, after seeking advice, the king made two golden calves. He said to the people, is it too much for you to go up to Jerusalem? I'm sorry, he said to the people, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Here are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. One he set up in Bethel and the other in Dan. And this thing became a sin. The people came to worship the one at Bethel and went as far as Dan to worship the other. Jeroboam built shrines on high places and appointed priests from all sorts of people, even though they weren't Levites. He instituted a festival on the 15th day of the 8th month, like the festival held in Judah, and offered sacrifices on the altar. This he did in Bethel, sacrificing the ca- to the calves he had made. And at Bethel he also installed priests at the high places he had made. On the 15th day of the 8th month, the month of his own choosing, he offered sacrifices on the altar that he had built at Bethel. So he instituted the festival for the Israelites and went up to the altar to make offerings. Instead of Jeroboam allowing his people to go to Israel to worship God, he sets up idols and el- and uh, altars here at Bethel, and Dan is up here, two of them, so that his people would not have to go down to Judah to worship. Jeroboam intentionally led the people of Israel away from worshiping God to worshiping idols, golden calves, the same kind uh, that were constructed by the Israelites at Mount Sinai when God was giving his commands to Moses. And there they said the same thing. Here are the gods that really brought us out of Egypt. Jeroboam does this awful thing. Jeroboam turns his back on God and leads people away from worshiping God. These golden calves become the plague that afflicts the nation of Israel for their entire 200-year existence. These calves constantly make the anger of the Lord burn against Israel. If you read through First and Second Kings, you will see uh, just an unending chorus of this one phrase. In, this slide is actually wrong. So, uh, First Kings uh, fifteen twenty six. Uh, I put Nabat up there. That's the father of. Uh, that's the father of Jeroboam. Nadab is his son. So 1 Kings 15, 26 is about Nadab, the son of Jeroboam. It says he continued in the sins that Jeroboam had led Israel to commit. Later, we learn about Bashah, king of Israel. He says, the Bible says he did evil following in the ways of Jeroboam. Then 1 Kings 16, going on, another king of Israel, Omri, he followed completely the ways of Jeroboam. When they say the ways of Jeroboam, they mean the Israelites are worshiping those two golden calves at Bethel and at Dan. Again, in 1 Kings 16, we learn the, the king of Israel, Ahab, he was awful. It says he considered it trivial to commit the sins of Jeroboam, but he did so all the same. Ahaziah followed the ways of his father, Jeroboam, who caused Israel to sin. Joram, the king of Israel, he clung to the sins of Jeroboam. These are six. There are twice this many. To be honest, it's just really hard to make those boxes that pop up and go away. And so it's like I got exhausted because they're all through reading First and Second Kings, you will see the story of uh, 
kings of Israel coming to power, and, but God condemns them. It says that they did evil in the sight of the Lord because they followed in the way of Jeroboam, son of Nebat. They did what Jeroboam had showed them how to do. Even after Jeroboam's family was condemned and, and wiped out, even after that, the sins that he exampled, the sins that he set up, the sins that he practiced would be followed in Israel for generations. Jeroboam was the chosen king of God to rule the northern ten tribes of Israel. God made a fascinating promise to Jeroboam. If you will just be faithful to me, I will make you like David. Can you imagine an Old Testament where there is a kingdom of Jeroboam like that of David's? But he, he chose, he had to choose between faithfulness and expediency. He had to choose between worshiping God and doing what would make him successful. Jeroboam chose what would enrich himself, strengthen himself, and he forsook God. He failed to trust God, just like the Israelites failed to trust God when they demanded a king. In doing so, he poisoned 200 years' worth of God's people right up to the moment that they were smashed and exiled by the Assyrians. When we read about Jeroboam and even Solomon before him, the lesson that we learn is that for each of us, especially us fathers. The most important thing we can do on earth, in our families, and in our church, is to leave a legacy of faith. To walk with God in such a way that our children, our grandchildren, and their children will be able to see the faithful walk of their fathers, their parents, their grandparents, their mentors, and their elders. What we learn from Jeroboam is that so much harm can be done to a family, to a church, even to a community by a legacy of unfaithfulness. Indeed, look at the great injurious harm that was done to the nation of Israel by Jeroboam and even by Solomon before him. But on the flip side, the reverse is true as well. A family, a church, a community can be so well served, can be impacted for generations by our legacies of faithfulness. Indeed, that is our job. That is our primary role. My father and I have gotten to do a lot of really cool things together. We have seen the Huskers win a lot of football games in person. Celebrated national championships. If you need me to tell you about what that is, I'll be available in the lobby after church. But what I remember my father most for is his legacy of faith. The way I would see and still see him help the poor, the needy. The times he would call me down next to his chair and tell me about what he was reading in the Bible. Tell me about my faith. Tell me about baptism in the church. Look at what the Word of God says in Psalm 78. This verse is on the inside of your bulletin. There the psalmist writes, My people hear my teaching. Listen to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth with the parable. I will utter hidden things, things from of old, things we have heard and known, things our ancestors have told us. We will not hide them from their descendants. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power and the wonders he has done. He decreed statutes for Jacob and established the law in Israel which he commanded our ancestors to teach their children. So the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born, and they in turn would tell their children. Then they would put their trust in God and would not forget his deeds, but would keep his commands. This is our job. This is the most important thing that we get to do in life. For us fathers, it is the legacy of faith that we leave for our children. 
For others, it may be the legacy of faith that you leave in your family or in your community, certainly here in our church. Now at this point, it is here important to point out something that is unfortunately true. That a legacy of faith does not guarantee a life of faithfulness by those who observe it. You see, Solomon and Jeroboam, we've looked at them this morning, they did evil. They were unfaithful to God. And we see the consequences that that behavior and that action brought to their family and to their nation that they led. But so too were David's children. I told you about the trouble that they got into, the evil that they did, the demise that they faced. David was a man after God's heart. David is a hero. David remained faithful, despite that many of his children were wicked and evil. The sad truth is that Satan prowls and devours like a lion. The Bible tells us that. And that even the children, the mentorees, the students of faithful believers rebel against God. That is sadly true. So as you hear this message this morning, I want you to allow in your hearts and minds that possibility to know that that could possibly be true. But at the same time, I want you to also consider the gift that was given to the rebel. No matter how far astray one of our children goes, one of the products of our church, one of the products of our community, no matter how far away from the Lord they get, there is nothing that will ever be able to wipe away the faithful witness of the people that they knew and loved in their family. The faithful witness of the people that they hear knew and loved in our church. The faithful and true and loving witness of the believers in the community of Brooklyn. Think of the gift, the irrepressible memory they have. One day, they may turn from their ways and they may return to God. They will have in their pocket something of immeasurable value, and that is the irrepressible, unstoppable, unerasable memory of the witness and testimony of their faithful father or mentor or teacher or friend here at Madison Church. Solomon and Jeroboam were focused on other things other than faithfulness. Their territory, their wealth, their influence, they forgot what was most important. Their faithfulness to God. They got distracted. They focused on other things and their families came to ruin from it. Their nations came to ruin from it. Their legacy was that of idolatry, idol, sorry, idolatry and godlessness. May that never be said of Madison Church of Christ. May that never be said of the fathers here at Madison Church. Let us do as the psalmist instructs. Things we have heard and known, things our ancestors have told us, we will not hide them from their descendants. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power, and the wonders that God has done. We hear this message in Hebrews 12 where it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin which so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance or endurance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame. That first verse is so important. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, the author of Hebrews there is talking about the heroes of the faith in the Old Testament, but we have heroes here. My dad is a hero of my faith. We have a responsibility to be, for those who come after us, an example of faithfulness, the example that Solomon was not, an example that Jeroboam was not. We have a responsibility to be that cloud of witnesses that propels our students, our children, to faith. And we have something, a gift that the people of Israel did not have. 
Because the author of Hebrews didn't stop there. He didn't say, he didn't say run with endurance just because you're surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses, but also because we can fix our eyes on Jesus. We can fix our eyes on the Christ who was for us the perfect example of faith. Someone who was not only righteous, without error, without blemish, but loved us so much that we, he would go to the cross to die for our sins. We have that example as well. As the band comes down this morning, I encourage you to consider the legacy you're making for generations of your family, for generations of our church, for generations in Brooklyn and around here. I get in trouble when I say that. I know a lot of you are from Grinnell and other weird places that I can't remember yet because I'm new here. Don't get caught like Jeroboam was forsaking your faithfulness to God. Don't get caught forsaking it for worldly wealth or worldly success. Those things are less important to your family, to your church, to your, to your community than faith. More than money, more than status, more than success, our children, in our families, in our church, and in our community need fathers of faith. Fathers who set the benchmark for belief in our families for generations. Join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, you're a great and mighty God. Dear Heavenly Father, I, I give you praise. And I'm amazed by all the people you show me in your life, in my life, that have walked by faith. Of all the people in my life that you have shown me love your son, Jesus, and want to obey your commands. Help me to remember their witness. Help their witness to remind my heart to run with endurance the race you have marked out for me, to throw off sin and everything that would hold me back to pursue your son, Jesus Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith. Heavenly Father, give us that encouragement. Help us to be that encouragement for others as we set the benchmark, the example of faithfulness in our families, in our church, and in our community. Pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, as we close today, would you stand and sing with us? I do have a favor to ask if anybody can stay around after church and help us take down uh, some heavy items. That would be wonderful. So thanks. Would you stand with us as we sing? Thank you.